Hello everyone, welcome back. This is Professor Xiao. In this week's lecture video, I will do things a little differently. I will focus on a business case and I will use the mindset of business and data analytics to analyze it. Along with introducing the case, I will raise a list of questions for you to reflect upon. I encourage you to think about those questions in what ways can you leverage data analytics techniques to try to answer those questions or leverage the data and reveal information to help answer those questions? And by these techniques, I mean exploratory data analytics, including graphs and visualizations. Then in the next week's video, I will refer back to what I talked about in this week and demonstrate how to use SAS and various visualization tools to make happen what I talk about today. Let me first give you a reminder and briefly review what I talked about in the previous week. I'd like to remind you that homework one is due soon. It's due by the end of this week. For the specific deadline, refer to the course syllabus. In the previous week, I focused on various aspects of the data pre-processing tasks I talked about the potential issues of unprocessed data. We also call them raw data. And I mentioned possible negative consequences of proceeding to data analysis without doing a thorough job in data pre-processing. I also talked a lot about missing data. Missing data is a very important issue in data analytics. I won't repeat everything today but I talked about one potential way to deal with missing values is to simply delete the entire row of data that has any missing values in at least one of the columns. And I emphasized the danger of doing that. I encourage you to reflect upon at least two major reasons why not to do this in dealing with missing data. In the previous week, I also talked about data transformation among the topics, I specifically talked about standardizing the scales of variables. There are two commonly used approach to standardize variables. One is z-score standardization, and the other is min-max or range normalization. Think for a moment about how they are similar and how they are different. I also talked about how categorical variable is not ready for being directly used in data mining without data transformation. So what is the best approach to pre-process the categorical variable in order to include them in data mining? There are also several other aspects of pre-processing that I would not repeat here. In the previous two weeks, as recorded in the SAS tutorial videos, I demonstrated how to use SAS EM Enterprise Miner to start a new project, to quickly get descriptive statistics about the data set and have an overview of the data set at a high level, how to use graphing and different plotting techniques to focus on individual or pairs of variables, and how to use transform data to standardize and normalize variables. In those long demonstration videos, I also delve into specific nodes that are very useful, particularly in understanding a new data set, including the transform variable node, by which you can quickly get overall distribution of each of the variables without even generating each of the graphs separately. If these don't ring a bell to you, I highly encourage you to go back and revisit those videos and follow along the video tutorial by replicating the tasks and performances on your own computer. Before I talk about the case study, I would like to make a few comments about what has happened in the data analytics and business analytics domain, and hopefully these will motivate you in terms of seeing how these are highly relevant. I'd like to talk about a few things that have recently happened in the domain of data analytics, particularly related to business. Are you familiar with this company or app which is called Zillow? Zillow is a real estate tech company which archives and organizes information about every single real estate property and make them available in their app which is called Zillow. 
The app is available on every major smartphone app platform. Recently, Zillow organized a data science competition on Kaggle.com. Are you familiar with Kaggle.com? It's a platform for data science competitions and it hosts tons of practice data sets and tutorials and practice projects for you to learn about data science and all of them are free. So Zillow would like to award $1 million to the top team who are able to design and train the sales price of a list of random properties that has a margin of error at least 10% smaller than their own algorithm. So think about it, a million dollars, that's quite a lot. So Zillow has done this for at least twice and each time a million dollars. If you are interested, you can search about Zillow or download the Zillow app. Once you download it, you'll find the service very familiar and friendly. So many teams participated in this competition. And by the end, the winning team was able to improve the algorithm upon Zillow's algorithm and to improve the error margin by more than 13%. So the winning team was a team of two and their solution was able to predict sales prices or the value of a property on average by an error margin of less than 4%. That is quite impressive. Competitions like these happen more and more often. As I recall, more than 10 years ago, a similar competition was launched and it was by the company Netflix. Now, everybody is familiar with Netflix, but by the time that the competition was launched, not everybody is familiar. So back then, Netflix launched a competition, not on Kaggle, but on a different platform, which awarded the team with a million dollar, and the winning team was able to improve the algorithm in recommending the next movie that the customer will like the most. And if you think about it, the prediction problem in Netflix is quite different from the prediction problem of Zillow. For Zillow.com, the sales price and the value of house is relatively fixed. There is a fairly well-defined target for, for almost all of the real estate properties that is existing. Maybe a very small percentage of these properties are difficult to predict because of unique histories, but for the majority of houses, we have the complete information about the attributes of the houses, including the owner's history, what year was it built, what year was it remodeled, the location, address of the property, and so on and so forth. These information are relatively publicly available and they do not change. However, in the case of Netflix, the prediction problem is trying to chase a moving target. The problem of trying to predict whether or not a viewer will like a movie and whether or not the viewer will recommend a movie if the viewer had watched that movie is quite different. There are millions of possibilities of what the viewer could like among the thousands of titles. And the company know little about the background of each of the viewer. They could only guess what a customer would like or not like based on the viewing history of this viewer in terms of what other movies has he or she watched. So the problem was quite daunting at first. But now we know that different algorithms have been invented to try to answer and solve that problem. Nowadays, companies like Netflix, YouTube, including many other social media platforms such as Facebook, Twitter, are able to leverage the social network data and information to predict what you will and will not like in terms of the content of their product. If you're interested, search in Google about Netflix prediction competition and read more about it. Motivated by competition that Zillow has launched in recent years, the final project of this course will be about the same context, although it will be a different data set it is about predicting the sales price of a list of real estate properties. In a team of maybe three or four students, 
The project will ask you to put together a comprehensive project that includes the full six cycles or phases of the process of data mining projects, better understand the data, manipulate or clean the data if necessary, and then build several models to try to predict the final sales price. Then by avoiding overfitting problems of the models, you will select the best model and implement the model on a test set on which you don't know the real sales price of the houses. And in the end, you will identify the 20 highest ranked properties in terms of their predicted sales price. I hope you will have fun in doing this project. I will talk more about this project when the time nears. And one last note about data and social media companies before I talk about the case study today. And you must be very familiar with Yelp.com. I use Yelp at least every week, maybe sometimes every day in some of the weeks because I dine out. I try to search for information about different businesses and services. So Yelp has been very helpful. Imagine that you are either the owner of Yelp.com or the owner of a business on Yelp that receives reviews from your customers. What can you do to leverage these data to answer whatever questions you might be interested? Fundamentally, what questions are you interested in that you may be able to leverage the data to answer? Think about it. If you have any ideas, let me know because it is nowadays quite convenient if you know how to program to collect massive amounts of data from Yelp and do some data crunching to answer interesting questions. All right, now let's talk about the case study today. Usually in a face-to-face -face classroom, students will be discussing their business plans and analytical strategies about this case study in groups. But now we are in online mode so I will encourage you to think about it independently and I will discuss aspects of this case study. So this course will focus on using SaaS EM software. Nowadays, there are many other competitive softwares and some of them are really good in doing particularly data visualizations, including Tableau as well as Microsoft Power BI. Those are software that are highly adopted in certain specific domains or industries such as oil and gas, which is particularly important to Houston. And there are nowadays many free tutorial videos and educational resources online that you can download for free. If you are interested in expanding your skill sets in terms of data visualization, I highly recommend you to go beyond SAS Enterprise Miner and to acquire one or more additional skills in terms of these different softwares. The goals of today's analysis clarify the issue, define the objectives analysis, we'll try to understand the data going from shallow to deep, to explore the data and think about what exploratory data analysis techniques that we can use to help answer some of the exploratory questions identify questions that are revealed from analyzing the data, occasionally use hypothesis testing to confirm business insights. Through all of these analyses, try to generate leads to further look into when we build the model. For instance, certain features and certain variables may need more time and more thoughts before we have a fuller understanding about how to model them. And what are the takeaways from these analyses? Let's start. The focus of the case study will be a telecommunication company and the landline phone service of the company. Here is the data set. The data set is churn. You may have already read about this churn data or done some homework questions using this data set. Here is the outline of the data set, including the background, the information, and properties of the data set, including a list of variables and types of data in the data set. The purpose of this case study is to help Telco, the telecommunication company, better understand the problem of the customer's churn and hopefully leverage their data set to uncover what might be the factors that could help predict whether or not the customer will churn. To clarify, churn is a common business problem, especially in marketing. Customer churn problem 
is mainly because customers cease to renew a contract with a service or that the customer has switched providers of the similar service. Churn problem is particularly important to companies because it is well known that the cost of maintaining a current customer is much less than the cost of acquiring a new customer. So if a customer churn, the customer must be an existing customer, it will be worthy to spend marketing budget to try to retain the customer if the company knew beforehand that certain customers are very likely to churn in the next period of time. Customer churn outcome is recorded in this data set in the target variable, which is churn. This is a binary variable that has two different possible outcome or values. This variable has a value of one if the customer churned in the subsequent month of the data collection. If customers did not churn, then this variable will have a value of zero. Let's take a look at the other variables. The rest of the variables would either be ID variable, background information that may not be included in data analysis, and those input variables included as part of the model. The X variables or the input variables, sometimes in statistical analysis, we call them independent variables or predictor variables. They include account length, the length of time that a particular customer has been with the company. Area code, the area code of the phone line that is the focus of the service. Customer service calls is the number of customer service calls that the customer has placed cumulatively to the customer service department of the company. International call, it's a binary variable of whether or not the customer included the international plan as part of the subscription plan. Similar to this variable, a few other binary variables exist in the data set. Another binary variable is vmail plan, whether or not the customer service plan includes the voicemail service. And two categorical variables, one is the phone number, particularly the number sequences, which is about seven digit wide, the seven digit phone number. As explained here in the data documentation, the phone number is a good candidate for an ID field because it's unique for every customer account. And it doesn't make sense to think that the customer numbers, the customer phone number would have anything to do with whether or not they would turn or not. It's believed that the phone number here is quite random. Another categorical variable recorded in text format is a state abbreviation. TX would stand for Texas. NY would stand for New York. This variable identifies the geographic location in terms of states of the residence address of those customers. For the majority of the rest of the variables, it records the extent of the activities of using various kinds of services, including voice messages, placing calls during different time periods of the day. It will be worth thinking about how can we leverage these data, these input variables, to try to predict or understand what kinds of customers would churn or are more likely to churn than other kinds of customers. The question of what kinds of customers would be more likely to churn is trying to describe an association or correlation between a particular attribute or property of a customer or a customer account with the target variable churn. As I talked about in the previous weeks, correlation is the statistical term or the coefficient to describe the extent to which two variables co-move or co-vary with each other. For instance, Suppose that male customers are more likely to churn than female customers. This is just an example. It doesn't mean that this is reflected in the data. I'm simply using it to make an example. If male customers are more likely to churn than female customers, then we can say that the variable gender is positively and reasonably correlated with the target variable churn, if what I stated earlier is true. In predictive modeling, 
knowing that certain input variables has a strong or fairly strong correlation, whether or not it's positive or negative, with the target variable. It's fair to say that this variable is quite likely to be an informative variable or a variable that has a higher predictive power than the rest of the input variables. So part of the job of the data understanding phase and the EDA tasks is to identify potentially highly or reasonably correlated input variables with regard to the target variable. After identifying those variables, it will be prudent to conduct further EDA analysis and also to include those variables in model training to further confirm their utility in predicting the target variable. Let's think about what kinds of variables are there and how can we uncover the relationship or how can we reveal the correlation between the different kinds of variables with the target variable. First of all, there are binary variables. In this data set, there are at least two binary input variables. One of the binary variable is international plan. Another variable is vmail plan. And think about how you can use visualization to uncover the correlation between these binary variables and the target variable churn, which is also a binary variable. So how do you reveal the strength of correlation or association between two binary variable? One is the input variable international plan. The other is the target variable. You can, of course, use correlation coefficient, which is rho, to categorize the strength of correlation. However, that correlation statistic may not be accurate here because of the fact that the target variable is binary. The input variable is also binary. Coefficient rho of two binary variables may not remove a whole lot of information here. Using graphical methods, including visualization, is quite useful and effective, quickly getting a sense of the strength of correlation. You may want to plot a bar chart for the international plan variable that has two bars, one for each of the discrete label here, those who have or have not subscribed to international plan, and look at the percentage of customers that churned within each of the group. If the percentage is similar, that means the two variables perhaps do not have a strong relationship. If the two have very different percentages, then it's likely that the two variables are correlated. For instance, I try to draw a bar chart for the variable international plan. The variable has two labels, no and yes. Let's just assume that there are equal number of customers who do not have an international plan, but similar number of customers who have the international plan. So the sum of the two groups will be the entire data set. Okay, now, so what are some of the scenarios that might indicate whether or not the two variables have correlation? Let's just assume that I will use blue to shade those proportion of customers who did not renew with the customer and use green to indicate those proportion of customers who did not turn so if we say that within those who have international plan, those who have churned is relatively 60% of that group. The graph will look like this. And let's then assume that only 15% of those who do not have international plan actually churned. So the rest of these bars would be indicated as green the proportion of those who did not churn. There are only two outcomes in terms of churn, those who churned and those who did not churn. So we started off with equal number of customers who have international plan. And we end up having, this is hypothetically, we end up having disproportional number of customers who churned, depending on whether or not the customer has or has not international plan. So what can you make of these data? At least what we can say is assuming that customers has international plan, the likelihood that those customers would turn is 
which is much higher than an expected likelihood of churn for customers who do not have international plan. Because of the relatively equal number of customers in each of the group and because of the highly different percentage of churn likelihood in each of the group, we can say fairly strongly that the two variables are correlated. Knowing the information about international plan will be very likely to be helpful in predicting the value of churn. But sometimes the input variable may not have equal percentage of customers in two different groups. Sometimes there are much more customers in one condition than the other condition. Let's assume that this number of customers have international plan, but this many customers do not have international plan. In these cases, how do we analyze the correlation between the two variables? Let's draw the number of customers who turned in each of the group. Let's suppose that this many, again, this is close to 15% of the customers turned and the same number of customers in those customers who do have international plan turned and this is 15%. And now here is again close to 70%. Because the size of the group who turned under each value of the international plan is the same. The size is K for both the turning groups in each of the group of international plan. Would you say that international plan does not have a relationship with the target variable? Not really. We do not simply look at the count of customers who churned in each condition. We look at the relative percentage or the likelihood of churning under each of the condition. So we would rather compare the percentages or the likelihood rather than the number of churners. In the larger group of customers who do not have international plan, only 15% churned. That means the likelihood of churn is about 15%. However, in those who do have international plan, 70% customers churned, or the likelihood of churn is 70%. The difference is huge. We look at the likelihood of churn rather than the absolute number of churners. In the data set, by using the bar chart, if we uncover that international plan do have a strong relationship with the target churn, we would definitely want to include international plan in the input variables and try to zoom into how useful the variable is in building the models when we evaluate the models. Besides the binary variable, we also have several categorical variables. For instance, we have state variable, which is categorical. Besides the state, we also have an area code variable that is categorical. So how do we analyze the correlation between categorical variable, which is input, and the target variable, which is binary? We can do a similar visualization as we did with the binary input variable. We simply plot the various bars. Each would represent a discrete label and observe the relative percentage or the likelihood of churn in each of the category and observe whether or not there is a changing pattern across the bars of the categorical variable. For instance, to draw quickly, if we analyze the correlation between area code and churn, whatever number of different area codes we have, we will have certain bars and you would observe the percentage of the churn in these different bars. If the percentages are different across the bars, or if there is a pattern of increasing or decreasing percentages or likelihood of churn, then you would conclude that the variable area code could be quite correlated with the target variable. However, if the relative percentage or the likelihood remains quite stable and fixed regarding the target probability, then you would conclude that the area code would not be predictive of the churn decisions. Besides the bar chart, 
For those categorical variables that have a relatively small number of categories or discrete labels, another technique that may be very useful is pie chart. A pie chart simply uses different rings to denote the different groups. For instance, if we have a pie chart of international plan again, we have two rings, one ring, and we have two rings. So one and two. We will not look at the inner circle. So the two rings would stand for different values of international plan. The size of the ring is not indicative of the size of the group. That's why pie chart is like a normalized chart where the pie sides would normalize the sides of each of the group to 100%. So we are only focusing on the relative percentage of the turners inside each of the group. And normally we would start drawing relative percentage from the same radius. For those who have international plan, relative percentage of turn is quite large. So going from here, it goes all the way up to 70% of the pi. So you would cross out, you would denote this large section of the outer circle to be turners and the rest of them to be non-turners. It's only 30%. But for the inner bar, these are the, those who do not have international plan and only 15% of the group turned. So 15% is like these. So only this much proportion of customers turned, while the rest of them did not turn. So using this pie chart, you can fairly easily compare the percentages. So the relative percentage is very easy to compare in a pie chart, as versus the relative percentage is, is a little more complicated here because it's not normalized to the same height. Besides categorical and binary variables in the data set, we also have many, many interval variables. Interval variables are those variables whose values can take real numbered values. In real business cases, however, typically those information about customers are typically positive values and all the way down to zero. For instance, Day minutes records the total number of minutes that are used to place calls during the day times, typically between 9 o'clock and 5 o'clock in the afternoon. So this variable is a continuous variable. It's typically in the range of 100 to 500 or 600 for landline phone services. How do we use visualization to understand the correlation between this variable and churn? the relationship between continuous variable and a binary variable, you may use a bar chart, but again, because the target variable is binary, correlation coefficient may still be limited in describing exactly the strength of the correlation between the two variables. Now, you may use scatterplot, as scatterplot is a lot of times used to visualize the correlation between continuous variables. However, because the target variable is binary, you would have some weird points aligned in two lines of the scatter plot, which may not be very helpful again. So in this case, a particularly useful technique would be binning. As I talked about in a previous week, for continuous variables, binning is trying to place the continuous region of a continuous variable into several baskets in order to better visualize its relationship between another binary or categorical variable. So here, suppose day means variable has a range between 0 and 500. One may use equal, you know, equal intervals to cut the region, to cut the range of day means to five buckets and transform the day means into a categorical variable with five levels. 
and after transformation one may use the bar char technique would have you know five bars this is transformed or another way to put it is the bind day means and the height is a count and inside each of the bars one may plot the number of churn and then one can look at the percentage of the churn or likelihood of churn in each of the category of the bind number day minutes to analyze the relationship between the two variables but if you think more about it we know that the distribution of day means is likely to be quite normal and symmetric. So those in the region between 200 and 400 minutes might be the majority of the customers, but those lying outside this region might be the minority of the customers. So you would end up have much higher bars for the, the three middle regions. So this is actually related to the different binning techniques and the underlying rationale for those different strategies of binning that is talked about in class as well as described in the book. So I encourage you to revisit the binning section of the chapter and to understand advantages of the several other strategies of binning. One of the binning strategies produce the bins that will have the equal height that will be easier for you to analyze the percentage or likelihood of churn. Whereas you can leverage this technique of binning to better visualize the relationship between the variable and the target, there may be some special cases. And here, the special case is with regard to the variable customer service call. As you know, not many people would complain about the services if the customers are overall satisfied with the service and the service occasionally had problem, they would have placed a few number of customer service calls. Very few customers will place a large number of customer service calls. So if you plot the histogram or bar chart of customer service calls, you would end up having high bars or few number of customer service calls, but very low bars or relatively low bars for higher number of customers calls, seven plus. For this kind of continuous variables that have limited number of unique values, or the values are quite small, you can still use a bar chart instead of having to bin the variable because you don't really have to bin the variable. It's like a binned variable and you can use the same bar chart with cluster outcomes of, of those, uh, each of the group in, to visualize the relationship between customer service call and turn. And as you can imagine, this is actually what the data look like. Those who are placing a lot of customer service calls are much more likely to, this is close to 90 or 100% of churn. But those who, this is not even that much, but this is a little bit of exaggeration. Those who place few customer service calls tend not to have many problems with the service and thus tend to stay put and not churn. So in these regions would be probably 20% of churn. So this is a dramatic difference in terms of likelihood of churn. So the customer service calls would be another informative or predictive uh, input variable to be included in building models. So far, I have talked about several techniques to go about analyzing a new data set, in particularly in trying to focus on the objective of the project in building a predictive model. And here, the behavior of interest is customer churn. I talked about different strategies to analyze the or visualize the relationship between different kinds of input variables with the target variable when the target variable is churn. Also, if the target variable is continuous instead of churn, 
the problem changes quite a lot, and it will require a quite different strategy,、uh, which we can talk about later. So the takeaways: exploratory data analysis is very useful in the initial phases of data mining projects, especially when you are trying to understand the data and try to apply your domain knowledge to understand the particular problems that this company faces. Exploratory data analysis could take a lot of time in a data mining project because of how labor-intensive and how much attention and effort it requires to properly analyze the relationships between different kinds of variables, what those variables mean, and to carefully interpret visualizations that you created, and to further make conclusions about an input variable. Carefully document the results. Of your exploratory data analysis for later use, when you are ready to build models and to compare and select different input variables. Also, when you interpret the results and the model performances in model evaluation phase, these insights uncovered from exploratory data analysis will also be very useful to further justify or project the behavior of interest. And here it is the customer churn behavior that you're interested in. Okay, this would conclude this week's video. I will be looking forward to seeing you in the next week. Bye.